Sorry, the vending machine's not working today. Um, so we are going to get started. Just to let you know, we're streaming live. Just to be cognizant of the the recording that's happening. How are you? Welcome. You can sign in. Um, I'm Delany, uh, chair of the Economic uh, Empowerment uh, Committee for National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Um, National Coalition of 100 Black Women uh, is a nonprofit organization that advocates on behalf of women and children of color in the areas of health, education, economic empowerment, strategic alliances, and civic engagement. On the behalf of our chapter president, Elizabeth Jones, I welcome you to today's seminar. Uh, obtaining and maintaining credit. <laughs> um, it's part two of a four-part um, economic empowerment series. Um, today our expert presenter is the fabulous Raquel Robinson, a uh, credit strategist for World Financial Services. Um, she's going to deliver some really good information. This is like a continuance of the last seminar that she and delivered um, information for, and we've been waiting for this part two. Uh, we're going to learn the steps needed to build a perfect credit score, what accounts to apply for, how to maintain a good score, and important dates to keep in mind. Um, our next seminar is April 25th. The time and the location will be announced soon, um, and you can register today on Eventbrite for that seminar. That seminar is going to cover financial literacy with a focus on saving, budgeting, paying off debt, assets versus liabilities, and financial discipline. I've got three things to ask from you today before I turn it over to Raquel. Um, sign in if you have not already done so. Make sure that you sign in before you leave. At the conclusion of the seminar, we're going to pass around a survey. Um, and that survey helps us with the quality of information we uh, offer to the community. So please do uh, complete that. Um, and number three, get comfortable and enjoy this information mm -hmm. that Raquel mm -hmm. is going to share with us. So take it away, Raquel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Again, like she said, I'm Raquel Robinson. I am the owner of Royal Financial Services, and I am a legally licensed credit repair company in Cleveland, Ohio, that is um, licensed to offer credit repair services. So today we are going to be talking about obtaining and maintaining credit because I know a lot of people um, struggle with that, um, just even knowing how to even get started. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, well, first, I just want to briefly just talk about what is credit. And um, credit is being able to have the ability to pay later for things that you get now. And the way that they um, determine if you qualify to do that, they want to check out your credit score. And so your credit score determines your creditability on whether or not you can pay over time for things that they are willing to give you right now and you'll pay for it later. So there are different scoring models that they um, utilize in order to determine what your credit risks are. And that is the FICO model and the Vantage scores are the two most common credit scoring models for consumers. Now FICO scores are primarily, FICO 8 is the most widely used credit scoring model for lending. And your FICO credit scores range anywhere from 300 to 850. And everyone starts with bad credit at 300 and you must work to earn 550 points in order to reach the perfect credit score. A question. Yes. At what age are you eligible to start building credit? So, uh, technically is 18 years old, but you can actually add your children as an authorized user. They can't go and apply for credit under 18, but you can add them as an authorized user. Some uh, banks do allow even as early as the age of 13. You can add them onto your credit card as an authorized user and it will start giving them history. And your payment, the, the history, the payment history of your credit card will actually start building them a credit file. So by the time your child is 18, they can have 750, 800 credit score when they turn 18 because of that. But they cannot open an actual credit card themselves until they are 18. Mm -hmm. um, so FICO is the most widely used credit scoring model in the industry uh, as far as lending. 
And so that was, they were the first company to offer a credit risk model with a score. It was created by engineer Bill Fair and Earl Isaac. One was a mathematician, one was an engineer, and they came together and they're the ones that actually created the FICO scoring model. Um, and so they first came out with it in 1956. However, they didn't actually come out with an actual score until 1989, and the housing market didn't start moving until about 1995. So it wasn't really until the 90s that credit scoring became big, because prior to that, people actually used to, it was very unfair, because if I didn't like Jessica, for instance, I could write information in her file, oh, she doesn't keep her house clean, and you know, you could just make up all of these unfair, unreasonable reasons why ABC company shouldn't lend her money, and that's, and people were literally like walking around with books, passing the information around, and that's how they determined who would get what, so it was unfair. And so that's where the Fair Credit Reporting Act actually came from in the 70s, because they had, the government had to come up with some type of fair, and it actually hasn't been changed since. We still have the same Fair Credit Reporting Act rules and regulations since the 70s when they first enacted that no, you can't just, because I don't like you, make up all of these stipulations as to why I can't get credit, but because I like you, I, I say all these nice things about you, and this person gets to have all this access. So they had to come up with a fair way to, you know, figure out how can consumers be able to get lending. And so that's actually why Bill Fair and Earl Isaac came up with the FICO scoring model, and then the housing market started using it in 1995, and it's just been going on since. Then we have, and so the FICO scoring model is, you, you can go on myfico.com to pull your FICO scores, and then you can also go on experian.com, all the major three credit bureaus, in order to see your FICO scores and um, just like that. So the next scoring model that's most, the ones that you probably see the most is the Vantage scoring model. Now the Vantage scoring model was developed by the three credit bureaus. So they are trying to compete with FICO. And so, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> it's okay. They were developed, it was developed by the three credit bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. And it is an alternative to the FICO scoring model, and they created that in 2006, so like I said, to compete with the FICO, with the FICO model. Um, and in the past, the Vantage score used to use a range of 501 to 990, and the most widely used Vantage score now are on the third version, and they have now made that to 300 to 850, like to match the FICO model. Now, the FICO scoring model, you actually have to have history of six months. That means you have to have opened up an account and you must have paid or had some type of usage of paying in history for six months before FICO will even generate you a credit score. So if you go and go get a car and you needed a co-signer and it's your first account, you're 18, your mom's co-signed and you are not gonna start seeing a credit score on the FICO model until six months of one-time payments or delinquency for FICO to actually generate you a credit score. Now Vantage, on the other hand, it's only one month. So that's why a lot of people see their Credit Karma scores, because Credit Karma uses a Vantage score. And so Credit Karma, people are always looking at their Credit Karma, oh my Credit Karma, but Credit Karma is actually more so for educational purposes because most lenders actually don't use Credit Karma. And so many people say, oh, I got a 700 credit score, or 600 and then they go to apply for something and they get denied they don't understand why and it's because that particular model it could have been that even though it shows some type of usage you it was only one month or two months but on FICO you truly didn't even get a score generated if you're brand new to credit and they go to pull your score and they're like we're not taking that risk you don't even have any score or whatever whereas the Vantage even though for educational purposes they gave you that information, it, <coughs> most lenders do not use, like Carvana is a lender that uses Vantage, but most banks, credit unions, any other type of uh, lending institution uses the FICO model, specifically the FICO 8 model, to gauge whether or not they will approve you for lending. How did you know 
from which credit bureau that that can lit, that the living institution uses, and can they change uh, um, the uh, credit that they're using? Um, how would you know? So um, it's such a game. Credit is really such a game, and it's unfortunate that they don't really put this information out there. But you have to do your due diligence, and you prior to applying for anything, you should call. If you're going to go get a new car with Mercedes. Hey, before you run my credit, because this is my personal information, mm -hmm. I want to know what sporting model do you use. Um, are you using a bike away? I would ask them. I want to know what's most auto lenders, because you have an auto score. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't even use FICO 8. Most auto lenders use the, the fifth model of FICO, the FICO Auto 5, which only looks at how you pay. It puts the most weight on how you pay installment accounts, which are accounts that have the same payment over time. That means your payment never changes. They want to know how have you ever paid a personal loan? How have you ever paid a car loan? You put the weight on your credit card, it's not going to hold that much weight. So the FICO the Auto 5 FICO model, the fifth model for auto lenders, is going to look at the, the most how you handle installment accounts. And if you handle those well, they'll give you a high score. And so you're going to want to know, they typically range between FICO Auto 5 and FICO Auto 2, the second version of FICO in the auto side, and the fifth version of FICO on the auto side. So you really have to do your due diligence and ask, or you can even Google it. Believe it or not, there are a lot of groups and um, people that have forums that literally post what state they're in because it's all based even off of your region. The U.S. Bank could have pulled for credit cards 508 Experian to see if you'll qualify for that credit card here in Ohio. Whereas in North Carolina, they may pull your TransUnion 509. So it's literally all based off of your region and what area you're in. Like it's, it really truly is a game. And that's why you have to do your due diligence and you go on forums. Like me, I'm not applying for anything until I know exactly what model they're pulling, what I look like on paper. Because at the end of the day, number one, I want an approval. Otherwise, I wouldn't be applying. And number two, I want the best interest rate. So I want the best approval. That I can get. So I want to make sure that my credit profile for the model that they're using is in the best position. And so that's why it's very important that you do that. And so we're going to get, once I get further into, I'm going to explain why your credit scores are even different. You know, when you go to look at the three bureaus, because that's something in itself. It's, it's really so much. It's so much of a game, and it's set up for the average consumer to fail. Because you think just because you pay your bills on time that you have good credit. And that is just not true. <laughs> and so we have the three major credit bureaus. I know you guys are probably familiar with these names and symbols. <laughs> TransUnion, <laughs> Equifax, Experian. They determine a whole lot about what you can and cannot do, what area you can live in, what type of cell phone you have, what type of car you drive. Um, these people are, these companies are privately owned companies. They are not government companies. They are privately owned entities. They are separate. They are not parent companies or anything like that. They are competing against each other. Um, and so that's something that you should know. And that's why they also had to come out with the Fair Credit Reporting Act to put some type of regulation on these private companies because they are not government that. And so we're just going to go over the cycles chart as to what is in a credit score. So 35% of your credit score is your payment history. This is the biggest piece of your credit score which is worth 192.5 points. So remember I said we're starting at 300 points. So just off you paying your bills one time, never being late, you can be up to 29 days late every single month and they never report you late because you have to officially be 30 days late before the credit bureaus 
can ding you as a person that doesn't pay on time. So you can actually be 29 days late and they cannot report you late. But if you have 100% payment history on any open account or on your credit report, you will gain 192.5 points. So now we are at 492.5 points. You just paying your bills, you still have that credit because we haven't got to the other pieces. Then we have credit utilization, which is worth 30%. Then your account age, 15%. Your credit mix, 10%. And your increase, which is another 10%. And so like I said, you must have 100% payment history to earn 192.5 points. And a late, one single late payment can drop your score 50 to 100 points. 50 to 100 points. The higher your score, the bigger the fall. Because it's unlikely that someone with an 800 credit score will be late. It's, it's just unlikely. Because they, they've shown so much responsibility over time to even get to that level. If they are late on account, they're in trouble. So that's why they take the biggest fall. And so if you have someone, that, if you are someone that has a high credit score and you somehow was out of town, you forgot to pay your credit card, you're like, oh my God, and you get this big thing, and you're like 150 points, how could my score drop 150 points? But if you had an 800 credit score, it's unlikely that you will become late. And that's why they give you the biggest hit, whereas someone that has a 500 credit score, they may only lose 20 points because they expect that. They expect you to be late. You've shown irresponsible behavior over time. So they're like, this is your norm. We're <laughs> gonna take 20 points from you. Let's say that they expect you to fail. If you have a low credit score, yeah, they, they expect you to continue to display irresponsible behavior. So you don't get as big of a ding because you're already low. Much <laughs> lower can you go? <laughs> I mean, they're already, you know, they already know you're going to pay the highest interest, you know. So you're not going to get the biggest ding as someone with an 800 credit score. And so again, utilization is 30% of your score, which is the second biggest category. So payment history, huge. Whatever you have to do, because one late payment can stay on your credit report for seven years. They hold that against you for seven years. And so when it comes to your utilization, this is where a revolving account comes into play because it's based off of how you utilize a credit card, something that is some form of revolving debt where your payment changes over time. And so you are in direct control of your utilization. You can change your score overnight. If you have a maxed out card, you pay it down, overnight your score can, this is the, the fastest way to increase your credit score is through your utilization. And so you always want to keep any type of credit usage. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Did you say that missing one payment stays with you for seven years? For seven years. Wow. Okay. Any negative information on your credit report is held against you for seven years. That is how long they are allowed to, per the Fair Credit Reporting Act, report so that anyone else that is getting ready to lend you will know what type of behavior you displayed in the last seven years. Great fair. <laughs> um, when I was a uh, loan officer, we would look at a rolling 12 one, mm -hmm. but if you close that account while you have that negative mark, that will stay forever. You and It just won't disappear. It can't stay forever. Well, not forever, but I'm just saying like for like the seven years, yes. but if you keep it open and pay it down, we would look at the 12 months. So if you haven't made any other late payment within those 12 months, we wouldn't count that one. At least my credit um, union wouldn't count that one against you. And every other lending institution is it's different. They all, typically that's normal. Um, if you're able, if you've had bad behavior in the past and you, for the next 12 months, got your stuff in order, you will start getting approved for things at better rates with 12 months on time payment history and 24 months really. They are really truly looking at what you've done in the last 24 months. But with these artificial intelligence now where you're never speaking to a person, 
they're looking for all of these checks. You go online, you apply for something, you get immediate approvals because they're checking, did this person meet this? Did this person meet that? So if they see you were 120 days late three years ago, you may get declined mm -hmm. because even though the last 24 months weighs the heaviest, they still are taking into account certain lenders, what you've done in those last seven years. But the last 24 months are the most important. You can rebound, you'll never get to the maximum approval, but you will rebound by changing your behavior and starting to be on time from this point forward. And so keeping your usage under 30%, 10% is the low for maximum points of 165 points. So how do we calculate credit usage? Say you have a thousand dollar credit card. Most financial forums, articles, blogs always say keep your credit score at 30 percent. That's the normal, normal, the normal number that we see. And so, in order to calculate 30 percent, you take a thousand, whatever your limit is. We're going to use a thousand for this example, and you multiply it by 30 percent. So that means your credit card needs to be at 300 dollars or less by your statement date, and we'll go into that further. But your statement date is always gonna be the most important date because that determines so much. And so the sweet spot, and to get the maximum point, which is 165 in this category, you really wanna stay at 10% and below. If you have multiple cards, of course you wanna try not to carry balances on all of your cards. Um, but if you do, you want to try to stay at 10% and below, try to have some of them paid off in full, and then if you are going to carry a balance on the others, you would be 10% or below because you have to show some type of usage. If you always never have a balance, then they really can't gauge how you're managing credit. And so 10% and below, 10% to 1% normally is like conservative. You have access to credit, but hmm, I don't really need it. And so that's why, go ahead. Why they have to, then the company starts sending you extra cards. So I wasn't using the first one. Why would you send me extras? And what do you mean by extra cards? Are you sure they didn't even send the first one, so they sent you another one. <laughs> they don't just send you cards. Do you mean that they sent you because your card maybe was expiring? But if you go normally two years without using they close your account due to inactivity. So when you say they sent you more cards, what exactly occurred? Did they send you more cards? another card with a higher amount. So they increase, so they do auto increases, so based off of your behavior. So you probably use your card very sparingly. And they're like, ooh, let me give her some more access to some more money. And so believe it or not, that's how you increase your score. If you can go three to six months just even though you technically could be maxed out and you pay your cards down by that statement date, you can automatically get an increase and raise your credit score. So when you do actually need to carry a balance, you can afford to because instead of $1,000, oh, I can only spend $300, really less than that, $100 to keep the maximum points in that category, I need a higher limit. I can't even go on a trip, spend $500 without my credit score taking a hit. So if I show good behavior for three months, then they raise my credit score, my limit to $3,000. So now I can afford to carry that $500 balance and pay it back over time and enjoy myself on my vacation. You always want to have access to credit when you don't need it instead of trying to get credit when you actually need it. Because that's when they, when they see that you need it, they're not going to give it to you. So your credit age accounts for 15% of your score. And as you use credit responsibly over time, you will gain age and earn up to 82.5 points. And the only way to speed up your age is to be added as an authorized user to a family member or a friend's credit card. And so the way that that works is, of course you wanna consult a family member or friend that's responsibly 
because you have to remember when you're added as an authorized user, you take on everything that they've done on that card. It now shows up. If they had a card for five years, if they were late four and a half years ago, that late payment is going to show up on your credit report. So you don't want to say, oh, can you help me out? I, I want to help boost my credit score up. I'm, you know, I only had credit for six months and no one will lend me anything because I'm too high of a risk. They really can't see how I've used credit. And so your mom says, okay, well, I'll add you on my card. If she's had stellar history for the last five years and she adds you on and her balances aren't maxed out, that is going to be, it's going to give you a huge increase because you're getting all of that history, even though you only have six months of credit history and you just got a brand new FICO score, it's now going to boost you up even higher because now five years is going to show up on your credit report and five years of payment history is going to show up on your credit report. So you always want to utilize a family or friend that's responsible and that you can ask them, have you been late? <laughs> um, is this card, you know, has low usage? Because so many people go and hop on, I look at credit reports all the time and they have their wife's card on there and it's all of these late payments and it's maxed out. It's like this, you need to get removed. This is hurting and your score is, is not helping you at all. <laughs> You have no late payments on your credit report, and here it is, your wife never paid your card note on time. You have this joint account, and it's, it's affecting you, so. How do you unsubscribe to a card? Well, you actually can. Once you um, co-sign or become a co-borrower, that's why that don't ever, under no circumstances, co-sign for anybody. You, you are better off helping them build their credit score and adding them as an authorized user and never giving them a card because that way they have no access to mess up your credit. They only receive your history. When you get to jointly being in with someone, you are just as responsible as them. If they go and file bankruptcy, they will no longer be held liable for the debt, whereas you will be because you're still on that loan. Mm -hmm. So you are neck and neck with them. They can go and file bankruptcy and not be, the, the creditors will stop calling them, they will never come after them for the debt, but if you, if you don't file bankruptcy or whatever, they're gonna still come after you, they can garnish your wages, everything. So under no circumstances, I tell everyone, you're better off helping someone build their credit than being a co-signer. Because you're basically saying, hey, if you can't pay, I'm gonna step in and pay for you. And if you're not, willing to do that or even in control to make sure and keeping track, calling them, hey, making sure they're not in trouble, then you could be affected tremendously. Because again, late payments will drop your score huge and then it's gonna be held against you for so long. So never ever, I don't care if it's your own child, you're better off adding them as an authorized user and helping them build their file. Hey, you need a car? It's gonna we're gonna start preparing for that now. I'm gonna add you on as an authorized user. We're gonna get you a, a college credit card. I'm gonna get you a, a um, secured loan where you basically deposit some money in a bank account and borrow against it and pay yourself back. So they'll report something of that nature to help them build their credit up. And then within three to six months, they'll be able to buy their car on their own if that makes any sense to anyone. But you, you, it's just too much of a risk. You just don't want to put yourself in that position. And even if someone who has bad credit comes to you and asks you something like that, you really should say no because there's a reason they have bad credit and then they're basically going to put you in jeopardy. I already don't pay my bills on time, but I want you to co-sign so I can get this car so I can still not pay my bills on time and now you're going to be held accountable and be affected in a negative way for a long period of time. It's just, it's just too much of a huge risk. You're better off helping them repair or build credit. So now we go into credit mix, and it's actually 10% of your score, not 15%. And this accounts for 55 points of your credit score. And there are two types of credit, that is revolving accounts, 
which again is credit cards, any type of card, store card. There are three types of credit cards. You have your store card. You can only use it at that store. So that's your Victoria's Secret, your Coles, your Sam's Club, different things of that nature. Then you have your traditional credit card, MasterCard, Visa, Discover, American Express. They are accepted everywhere. And then you have what is called a charge card. Typically, charge cards are owned with American Express, and that means you, whatever you use, must be paid off within 30 days. You spend 10,000, you gotta be paid in 30 days. So you have your store card, your regular credit card, and a charge card. Those are the three forms of revolving accounts. And that means that your balance can change depending on what your usage is. And then we have installment account. That means you have the same payment over time. You go take out a $5,000 loan, they say your payment for five years is $127. That payment is never gonna change for five years. Yeah, you can add additional money to go to the principal, but your set payment that's always gonna be due will be $127 no matter what. And that goes for personal loans, student loans, car loans, those are your installment accounts. And so it's good to have a credit mix. They want to see how can you utilize a variety of credit. So that means you want to mix it up. They want to see how can you handle the credit card. Do you still have that store card, that Victoria's Secret from when you were in college? You know, do you still have, you know, student loans that you're still paying on? How have you been handling those for the last 10 years? And even if you, go ahead. Was it a, if it's an installment payment, you yeah. have to pay the same thing all the time. If you make the extra payments on the principal, you're gonna, gonna pay it off. It, you're gonna pay it off faster, but your set payment is still the same. Is it okay to pay off an installment loan like account faster? Like yes. Okay. Yes. You you always want to do what's best for you. Even though you pay the account off, it's still, as long as it was good payment history responsibly, it is gonna stay on your credit for 10 years. So you're gonna still continue to get that history. They'll be able to still see how you handle an installment account. And then if you get any type of negative behavior on that installment account, it's gonna fall on your credit report after seven years. Because again, they can only report something negative against you for seven years. Have you ever been penalized for paying off something early? Yes, you do. Um, and the only reason why you do it depends on what's on your credit profile. So if you don't have a variety or multiple, like say for instance, you have two credit cards and you had a car, um, even though you're still gonna get credit in the history category, once you pay that car off, your score is gonna drop a little bit because now they no longer are showing any type of payment history for that credit mix category but you're gonna still start the game more, just over time, you'll still rebound those points back, but you do get penalized because you're no longer being able to gauge how you're managing some type of installment account. So you're penalized if you're late, you're penalized if you're on time, you're penalized if you pay it off. Yeah, it's all a game. It's, it's always a game. game. So, I mean, the way we combat that for my clients is, you know, when I see someone that doesn't have some form of an installment account, we utilize some type of credit building tool where they borrow against their own money and then you're just paying yourself back. So like self-lender. So self-lender, credit strong, going to your actual bank and taking out like some type of pledge loan where, you know, you put a loan against money that's in your own account and you're literally just $25, $40 a month to your own money. It's that To me, that's the easiest way to not utilize getting a debt because it's your own money to help keep that history on your credit profile. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, what would you rather do? Go apply for something and get some type of low interest, I mean, high interest rate, require a down payment, or get a loan against your own 500, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be a large amount, and that's what people don't realize. 
even with credit cards, you don't have to have a high limit to build a high credit score. You can literally start with a $300 credit card, two $300 secure cards, as long as you show, it doesn't calculate your limit. It's calculating how you are managing that card, that limit, and what is your usage? Can you be under 10% or below on that card? Because the same behavior that they do to increase your limit on a $300 card, they use that same algorithm to increase your limit on a $10,000 credit card. It doesn't matter. Your, if you, two people's behaviors are the same, they're both gonna get an auto increase if they're doing the same thing. So people think, oh, I only have this $300 credit card, but if you can't manage the little money, then they, they don't wanna give you the bigger money. So it, it really truly, unfortunately, is a game. <laughs> it, it really is. And it's, it's unfortunate. Then we have our increase, which is 10% of our credit score, another 55 points. A soft entry is having your credit pool with no impact to your credit score. So this is you going online, going on Credit Karma, looking at your credit scores. You, uh, when you see any type of websites on the internet where it'll say, oh, we'll see if you're pre-qualified, just putting your information in the last four digits of your social, no things to your credit. They're actually going in and they're looking at your credit because it's a soft pool. And there's a section on your credit report that is strictly for inquiries, soft pull inquiries that you can look at to see who's been looking at your credit report. Because believe it or not, your lenders that you currently have are always checking your credit, soft pulling it, seeing, hmm, let me see how, how she's managing her other credit. Because if you have a Home Depot card and all of a sudden they see you starting to get laid on your car note, they're like, and they soft pull your credit, and, they're, and they say, hmm, she looks like she's in trouble. She might max our card up. We about to lower her limit. And so that's why people don't understand why their limits got lowered. And it's because your lender was soft pulling your credit. They saw what your other behavior was. Even though you have good behavior with them, they saw that you were in trouble with your other lenders and they wanted to protect your assets. So they lower the limit. Store cards are known for doing that. <laughs> they they saw fool you like crazy. You have that Victoria's Secret card or that Express card, and all of a sudden you start to be late on other cards, they will lower your limit in a minute, immediately. And you're like, Dad, now I'm over the limit. And that's how that happens. Even though you technically, you spent a thousand dollars, but they lowered it to 500, now you're 500 dollars over the limit. And that's actually how that happens. You either go over the limit or they lower your limit. And so now a hard inquiry is having your credit pooled and the lender displays on your credit report that they have viewed your credit to determine if you qualify. And a hard inquiry is credit impacting and most people lose three to five points per inquiry. And again, it just depends on the credit bureau as far as the inquiries and the impact of credit that you have because like American Express, they only pull Experian. So that means if they pull your Experian credit report, you're only gonna see the points lost in that on that credit report. You won't see it lost on the other two. Just for a minute, go ahead. Stay, I almost yes. done on the hard inquiry to determine if you And so inquiries typically stay on your credit report for two years, so 24 months. You normally start gaining those points back within six months and you really don't have much of an impact after 12 months. However, depending on certain lenders who are inquiry sensitive, they will hold it against you up to that 24 months. And so after two years, no matter what, an inquiry will come off of like you know when you're home searching mm -hmm. like I mean it's been so long since I've had to buy a house mm -hmm. like and you're you're going to different loan institutions mm -hmm. so like every time that you go to one to see 
what they give you, they your rate goes down. Yes, they are definitely dinging, but there is something called deduping. And what deduping is, especially for in specific for mortgages, you have a 45 day window for the FICO scoring model. And that means you are allowed to shop. And they will count that you can go shop at 10 different mortgage lenders. And they will count all of those entries as one. They deduce it. As long as you shop within that 45 day window. And they typically do it for cars as well. Within 45 days, you can go to multiple car lenders and shop and have them pull your credit, even though I would never recommend that because car locks, number one, they, they shotgun them. your credit to yeah. 50 lenders. Mm. And yeah, they may do be dupe it. However, some lenders still hold it against you. And what do you say, e dupe it? D dupe it, it's called the e dupe it. How do you spell that? enough that we're going to get this car emission. Like, what worries me, whether or not you find a property, either rent or buy, but the house doesn't sell, and the house sits on the market for three more months, and you get a prospective buyer, you find another house, you go, so does that mean that your credit history is going to be impaired once you're beyond that because 45 well, days are you a month and a half yeah are you speaking of when you say he's going back on the market are you speaking of you being the seller because the seller yes. doesn't take a hit the, no one's looking at the seller's credit because you're not trying to prove for a loan but if you have people that are you don't know whether or not they're going to be compliant with yeah. that so you still have to ha have a house to go to. And it's, again, you think you can sell the house, but there's no... I'm not I sure if I truly understand your your question, because the seller is not gonna take a hit. Only the, the potential buyer who's out shopping for your home would be the one whose credit is being pulled, who will be subjected to that 45 day but if I find a house, if I find a house to either buy or rent, yes, and because I think the house is going to sell, yes, and they have it pulled, the house doesn't sell. The house sits on the market for three to six more months. I go out and buy, you know, look at it. I have to find another apartment because well, when normally apartments aren't going to rent to you for three. But if you have to, if you but are, they, they still pull you, don't they pull your FICO score on that end to make sure that you can pay yes, the rent? They, so when it comes to rental, they use your rental report system. Even though there's the three major credit bureaus, they are like 500 other behind the scenes repositories that collect your information. And so mm -hmm. when you go to apply for an apartment, they're going behind the scenes and pulling your rental report. So is that a soft or a hard? It's still a hard. It's a hard. Yes, because they're not only pulling your three major credit bureau credit scores, depending on which model they're using, they're also going in and seeing what your rental history is like to see if you have an eviction. Because normally evictions don't show up on the, unless the it's been sold to a debt collector or debt buyer and they report that you owe a balance, but it doesn't say like eviction. Whereas in your rental report, shows that you have an eviction when they go to pull that. So and same thing with the house, they're still gonna be accessing, and again, it just, it just concerns me. Well, if you're constantly moving like that, yes. Well, it's not constantly moving, it's you think that you can, you found something to move into. Yes. 
maybe you don't even have a buyer, but yeah. you want you or somebody's really interested, mm -hmm. that's still going to hurt your credit score. If they have to repool, if you're dealing with a particular institution that will mm -hmm. lock your credit report in because they know what your situation is, then that's something that you would want to speak with them about. That hey, I may be moving into this apartment in three months. Can you keep? I want you to utilize the same credit report because then if it goes off for six months and I don't move in, I don't want you to repool my credit. That's something that you have to speak with them about individually if they have any type of guidelines or information for that. Okay, because you know up front that because you know you a decent front. rate. The best thing you can people can ever do, which we all I've personally done, is we avoid speaking to our creditors about issues that we're dealing with, you're about to be late on your credit card, call versus taking that hit and that late payment or whatever. You'll be surprised what type of uh, measures are in place to assist so that you don't, you know, so it just depends on who you're dealing with. They may have some type of measure in place that will assist you in that situation where they won't continue to repool. Did you have a question? I don't know if she has a question. So yes, I can give you after class a list of companies that you, because you are actually entitled to a free copy of all of your credit reports every year. Every 12 months you're entitled to see and view not only all the three credit bureaus, but the behind the scenes repositories and I can give you a site and actually everyone um, where you can actually go either online, your LexisNexis, uh, your Anovis, I mean, early morning check system. You can literally go and request that they send you a copy of every last report that every single company has behind the scenes because you'll be surprised with how much information is inaccurate, wrong. I have a lady, she went to apply to increase her SAS card and she couldn't understand why they would not increase her limit. She had a good credit score. But they kept on saying your information isn't matching. We're, we're not going to increase. And she said, by giving you every phone number that's on my cell phone account, it possibly maybe my husband's number somehow popped up on something of mine, or my girlfriend who's on my cell phone account somehow somebody else's phone number was on her Lexus Nexus report, not her credit report. And because sex not only pulls your credit, your three bureaus, they also pull your Lexus Nexus and match your information based on what you put on your application. And if it didn't match, they went to prove her. Wow. So it is actually very important that you go and pull. That's why I said it's so much. I could talk about this all day. It's so much information that people are literally out there collecting data on you. They're scrubbing the court record seeing if you ever got a judgment or a civil suit or filed bankruptcy. The courts don't report your information. It's small repository companies going into PACER, LexisNexis going in and scrubbing these court records, looking at the dockets every day. That's their job to see how, if you're in the court system. The minute, if you notice, if you've ever gotten a speeding ticket, all of a sudden, within days, you're getting mailers in the mail. Did you? You need a lawyer to come look right. at your because <laughs> your information is being sold constantly. Someone is literally looking at everything. They're on your social media. You're being watched like crazy, and people are taking that information. That's why Facebook is in a lot of trouble now because so of the privacy that. that they that we actually don't have. And they're like, "Yeah, I signed up for Facebook, but I didn't know that you were technically looking at my phone." and looking at what other sites that I'm looking at in my browser. I didn't know that you were going in and selling my information or tapping into my microphone and listening to me and could, because all of a sudden you're thinking about something. You could be pop up thinking up about a and and car and all of a sudden it pops up when you're in a conversation <laughs> with a friend and, you, say, yeah. and mm -hmm. you mention a car and all of a sudden yeah, you're getting phone. ads yeah. like crazy yeah. on that particular information because someone is actually listening mm -hmm. and they are watching you like a hawk and it is all type of behind the scenes bureaus that is collecting this data and I'm talking about fast they're selling because you can get a 
ticket today, and in the mail tomorrow, you're going to have five mailers from attorneys saying, can we help you? And that's how they're getting your information. So you are entitled to a free copy of all of the credit bureaus, because technically they all are credit bureaus. They, they have some type of um, way of determining if you're approved for something. If you constantly are opening up a different bank account every week, your check systems, early morning bureaus, they want that. And then all of a sudden you can open up a Chase, a U.S. Bank, a Bank of America, Wells Fargo. You get over here to Huntington, they're like, I don't know what you're doing. I ain't trying. Right. You, you're jumping all over the place too much. Or if you constantly overdrafted and didn't pay that bank back and um, the account closed, they know. And that's why you can't get a bank account because it's in your check system. And it's on your early warning report. This is, it is showing up on your credit report. You will not see that information on your credit report. It is the behind the scenes repositories that are collecting your information and they are selling it. And all banks pull those to see how you manage your business with other banks before they decide you can be denied and open up a new bank account. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it really truly is a big business and the credit bureaus are privately funded companies and as I get further into I'm going to go into more detail as to why your credit scores are even different. You say well, I buy stock in some of these companies. I don't want to buy stock in some of these companies. You say well, I don't want to buy stock in some of these companies. You say well, I don't want to buy stock in some of these companies. You say well, I don't want to buy stock in some of sites would you recommend the most? Like, as you were saying how Credit Karma is more of a... They're more so for... So, no credit scores are wrong. Okay. Okay? They're Depending on who's pulling what is going to determine, you can have a 700 over here, but if they don't pull that, you know, all credit scores are gauging how you utilize and using their algorithm with your information. So, none of them are technically wrong. Okay. However, if your credit karma, if they pull your FICO, you think your credit karma may give you more points on their algorithm because they're, again, only looking at you for one month, whereas FICO is looking at you for six months, and credit karma don't really look at medical debt or, you know, something else, whereas they look at all of that. So that's why your scores are different because each algorithm is scoring you differently. And that's why it's important to make sure that you know what version and what scoring model they're using because you may think you're good over here, but they really gave you a lot of points. Yeah, I see I see that because I use Wallet Hub and Credit Karma. Yeah. It'd be totally two different two scores. Is, it's Wallet like Hub and updates daily compared to Credit Karma monthly. And it'd be two I'd be like, hold on, Credit Karma is something this, but Wallet Hub telling me a whole other exactly. thing. Exactly. And then you go pull your property scores and it's something else. Right. Uh -huh. You know, you look at your capital one and they're giving you advantage three point oh. You're looking at your discover, they're giving you a FICO A. You're looking at your Navy Federal card, they're giving you an echo tax yep. FICO and line. That's exactly how it is. And you know, you gotta <laughs> keep track. I use Credit Karma. Um, I found it good for it alerting you yes. to weird things that are happening. I found yeah. two or three things. Yeah. that I didn't know about and I was able to follow up because they they mm -hmm. pinged me. Yes. Credit karma is definitely excellent for alerts. But yes. as far as really truly seeing where you're at credit wise, they they really are not a good um, model to use because most lending is not utilized by the vantage models. So who's the who's the FICO, you want to either go on it. I utilize Experian.com or myfico.com, one of those two, or simply going to the credit bureau. So, so I mean, Experian is one that used to be Credit Check Total, but they took over Credit Check Total, and that's why a lot of people utilize Experian.com. And what I like about Experian.com is that not only can you get your scores for the three credit bureaus, you can also get your scores for your mortgage scores. You can see what your auto scores are because when it comes to mortgages, they use your fourth version of TransUnion, your fifth version of Equifax, and your second version of Experian. Those are the only three, no matter what, I don't care, you go get a home in North Carolina, 
I don't care if you go get a home in Missouri, they are gonna use those three models for those three bureaus everywhere. It is enterprise-wide, like that is what they have to use. They're not allowed to use in the mortgage industry, no other three models. So if you're getting ready to buy a home, you wanna go see what your experienced second version looks like, your fourth version of TransUnion, and your fifth version of Equifax. What are those three scores? What is your middle score of those three scores? And that's gonna determine what you're approved for. Could oh. you say that just a little slower? Yes. Okay. So I know you, your favorite one is myfico.com. Yes. That's the one that but where you got, where you want to be was with the second version. Of the second version of experience, so your experience two. Okay. Your fifth version, your it's actually your Equifax Beacon 5. That's what it was, the Beacon 5th version of Equifax is what it was back when they came out with that model. Beacon 5. Mm -hmm. And then your TransUnion 4, your fourth version of TransUnion. Those are the three scoring models that they would utilize to verify, determine what you qualify for for a home, no matter where you go. I went at my annual credit, that one .com. Yeah, so annualcreditreport.com is also where you, that is where you go to pull all three credit reports, not your scores. You can see all three credit reports free every 12 months. And then if you are denied credit, you are entitled to receive a free copy of all of your credit reports within 60 days of you receiving a denial. And then of course, if you are on type of any type of government assistance, you are also entitled to get free copies of your credit report to maybe help you get more some type of lending or help you come out of that state. So they are entitled to more credit reports. So it's my annual credit report. Annual credit. Annual credit report. Annual credit report. Annual credit report. But that is different than what you just described about the breakdowns between Experian 2 and Equifax 5. So is those are only your mortgage scores. I mean, you can get your mortgage scores. I like to use Experian, I know for so Every 30 days, it will show you what your mortgage scores are. It, it will pop up, whereas the other ones, you may have to do more clicks and figure out where they are. Experian.com is the easiest to see all of your auto scores, all of your mortgage scores, your bank credit card scores, because they use, some banks may use, normally they use FICO 8, but some of them use the fifth version or the second version of the bank card scores to determine if you qualify for a credit card. You have so many credit scores, it's crazy. Does this keep changing? So your credit scores are a snack in time. So what you did today could be totally different from what's going on tomorrow. You could have a max out card today and not have a max out card tomorrow. So your credit scores are always changing, no matter if you have good credit or not, because of an account could be closed tomorrow. You can open up a new account. I mean, so your scores are always ever changing. So when people be like, oh, my score went down. Okay, well, what exactly occurred? You know, there's always a, rebucketing phase that's going on. You know, they're constantly throwing you into these buckets. Oh, so you're a person that has a bankruptcy. You go into the bankruptcy bucket with people that have a bankruptcy who may have rebounded and paid over time, or you're a bankruptcy person that maybe have started new credit and you got some late payments, or you're a bankruptcy person. So you're in all these different buckets and you're being scored and moving up. Once you move up to a certain level, you jump into a different bucket. So you could be open up a new account, your score is going to drop because now your age has just changed. But within 30 days, it's going to start rebounding because now you're going to jump into another bucket. So it's just, it's always ever changing. I had a, um, the American Express called me or emailed me because their purchase came up on my, on my number and it, it told me it was out of line. Mm -hmm. with, I purchased with major payments because that's probably the credit issue that they keep eye on, credit on. So that's more sort of the fraud risk, you know, even your banks are doing that. All of a sudden they see yeah. a whole bunch of $10 charges. They're like, what's going on? They have their own internal risk 
that's going on, and then again, your vendors are also soft pulling your credit as well. And so there's not a line with what has happened in the past, and so it's all paid. Well, I mean, it's it's more so, believe it or not, for your protection. If they see something, again, they're monitoring you like crazy. So if you're a person who you pay your mortgage on time every month, you pay your car, they see the, the same dollar amount coming out your bank account over time, and all of a sudden you spend a thousand dollars on groceries, and then all of a sudden you spend seven hundred dollars on this. They're like, is this you, or is this somebody else? Because normally for the last Three years, your your usage, your behavior has been the same. What is they just? They're really doing that for your protection, and they want to verify did you make this purchase? Because again, they want to protect their assets. <laughs> they want to make sure that because majority of the time when that fraud takes place, those people are gone. They swipe, they get that merchandise. They're never going to find those people. So that that's a loss that they have to take. Someone compromises your credit card or your debit card and they order some iPads, they get that stuff sent to an abandoned home or whatever, they get that merchandise. By the time the police get there, those people are gone. They'll never know who it was. They used your card, some fake name, some fake address, they got the items and they're gone. So they want to protect their assets. If they can stop the transaction, they want to stop it. So don't look at it as, don't pay it, you know, why are you guys questioning me? They're really truly doing that for your protection. So definitely you should be grateful that they're taking those measures to protect you. Well, I'm grateful and glad that they did catch it because it showed how they ran when I back. And uh, I'm going to presume that they didn't pay it because they didn't come back up on my statement. Yeah. Yeah, you told them not to pay it. Trust me, they stopped. <laughs> they they want to protect your, their assets. It's, it's connected in a way, but I just wanted to make everybody aware. I had a friend, um, his uh, identity was stolen, and it happened when they uh, ported his phone number, so they got access to his account mm -hmm. and transferred his phone account, his cell phone account, mm -hmm. and from that they had access to everything. So just be aware and cognizant of your second password verification yes. on your phone, yes. because that is how they did everything. Yes. Yeah. And once they get access, it, it's hard to clean that stuff up. I mean, it can be done, but you know, it's just an inconvenience when you have to go in and file the identity theft reports and say, hey, this was not mine. I didn't do this. And again, even though information, you not only have to clean it up with three credit bureaus, you got all these behind the scenes people that also have that data. And, you, and people don't realize you gotta go clean them up too. And it's time consuming. And that's why that identity theft protection that you see with a lot of credit monitoring sites are a million dollars and this high amount. You're thinking like, why would it be that much? Mm -hmm. Because it's, if you have to get an attorney involved and depending on what happened, it can really turn into a mess. So credit cards are one of the most powerful forms of credit on your credit profile. If managed responsibly, you can have an open credit card forever. Compared to having a mortgage or a car, eventually they're going to close. A student loan eventually will close. So a credit card is the fastest way to improve your credit and the way to be able to maintain it the longest because if you manage it responsibly, you can have it over time and not be in debt. You know, the goal is not to be in debt, but to get access, to be able to utilize your credit to leverage for investments or whatever it is that you may need. So we suggest three to five credit cards and at least two installment accounts to start a credit profile. That is what you need. Capital One and Discover are great starter cards. And we always recommend pre-qualifying. I recommend this for everything. Pre-qualifying before ever applying and giving a hard inquiry because you want to know if you're going to get approved. Why take an inquiry and lose points and it be held against you for possibly up to two years and you know you're going to get denied? 
you might as well either Google the pre-qual links or figure out how you can pre-qualify yourself to say, hey, it looks like we can approve you for up to three cards. Which one would you like? You're, it's not a guaranteed approval, but it's a good, they'll definitely let you know if you don't qualify. <laughs> Put it like that. Um, and so it, a lot of times, even with Capital One and Discover, depending on what state your credit is in, you may not even qualify for a secured card with them, where you will um, not have to, and what a secured card is, you have to put up your own money. Because they don't trust you that much that you have to put up your own money before they will even decide to even start lending you some unsecured funds. <laughs> and so remember, hard inquiries are credit impact, and if you're going to take a hit, you want to be approved. And if you're on a able to qualify for an unsecured card, a secured card would be your next step. And again, that's where you take $200, $500 of your own money, and you either send it to that credit card company or they deduct it off your debit card or something, and you actually have to display usage of your own money before within three to six months they may unlock it, or they will send you your money back and say, hey, you did some good behavior. We're gonna send you your money back and give you a credit line of $2,000 because you, you were able to show so you can manage your own $500, we'll give you access to some of our money. And so this is, <laughs> this is the biggest piece that I feel like no one talks about. I don't care what finance blog you're on, forum, Googling, nobody's really talked about how important your due date is versus your statement date when it comes to managing a credit card. And so if you have a credit card, you want to be aware of your due date, which determines how much interest you pay during your billing cycle, depending on how much you charge, actually, at the time of your due date. If your bill is paid after the due date, you will receive a late fee, not a late payment on your credit report. Okay. So your due date determines how much interest you pay. So you always hear, if you pay your balance in full by the due date, you pay zero interest. There are people that have credit cards, they never pay any interest because they pay their balance in full by the due date. Whatever your balance is after the due date determines your interest. But that the date that follows the due date is everything, your statement date. The statement date is by far the most important date if you have any credit cards that you always want to know what your statement date is, period. It should be on your phone, you should have it in your mind, you should know when that statement date is, period, because it's determining how they are monitoring you for credit. The, this date is usually three to five days after your due date, and your balance at this time is the balance that is reported to the three major credit bureaus. This is the most important date because depending on your credit usage and payment history on your statement date determines how the credit bureaus rate your credit worthiness. So I, just like in the last class, I hear pe people spoke on how at the due date, they pay their balance in full. But the next day, they run their credit card up. Those people most likely have bad credit. And the reason why that is, is because that statement date is following after that due date. And when their balance is reported, it's going to show, even though they paid their balance in full on the due date, they are reporting to the credit bureau that this person is maxed out. They obviously can't manage credit, and their scores are reflecting that. So. You can literally miss your due date every single month. They're never gonna report it. They'll never know about it. It's what you did on that statement date that's gonna determine what your credit worthiness is and how they're gauging how you use credit. So your statement date is the most important date. You, If you have multiple credit cards, you wanna know what that date is. And at your statement date, you want to have your credit cards, they say 30%, but it should be 10% and below. That is to get the maximum points in that category. Again, it's 165 points. 
and you want to have your car at a nice conservative balance at that time. And then after that, if you want to utilize your car, you can use it. Anybody have any questions about that one? Excuse I use it. I was home and pulled out everything. I I <laughs> Because <laughs> it literally, it, it changes, it's a game changer. Score went. Immediately. Your score will change check immediately. Check these statement decks real quick on these credit cards. Yes. <laughs> I, I did exactly the same pulling them all out. And when I called the credit union and it said, well, oh, like certainly, and your points just shot up just like overnight. Instantly. It's the fastest way to improve your credit score by showing a conservative balance by their statement. And all, even not even credit cards, any account, they all have statement dates technically, you know, mm. that, but the credit card is more so for that utilization category, which is the 165 points. They're really not, to a certain extent, you're getting a utilization, you know, if you have a mortgage and you've had your mortgage for 20 years and you took it out for 200,000 and you owe 198,000, they're gonna ding you like, why haven't you paid this off? <laughs> Even though you paid on time, you could have refinanced and did a modification and all these things to keep increasing the balance. You look bad in a utilization way, but it's not weighted as heavy as you, how you utilize credit cards. So yeah, they're gonna ding you if you've had this loan for 20 years and you ain't paid none of it off. <laughs> like, your usage is not matching up. So you will get dinged in that area, but nowhere near what you would go on with a credit card. And that's why credit cards, a lot of people may not like them, but in the world that we live in today, you need them um, because, and you need to learn how to use them. Because if you don't, you're just gonna pay more money for everything because everything, we live in a credit-based society. Everything you do utilizes credit. <laughs> Now with the paper company and cash and the person behind the cash, they stop answering on which card I want to get. I want to pay for it in cash. And then somebody just stood there. When they, when you send your payment into your loan services, 
service their roads, Navient, Bed Loans, Great Lakes. They divvy up six dollars to that one. Your bill is one forty-five a month. They put six dollars to that loan, ten dollars to that loan. They divvy it up. Nothing's really going to the principal. You know, so it, it's really truly if you you have to take. No one is going to look out for you better than you. And you, and that's why we as consumers must do our due diligence. And that's why I said when you go to apply for something, you demand to know what you not pulling my credit mm -hmm. until I know what you're looking at, what, what your criteria is, because this is my money. You're not gonna tell me how to spend my money. And that's the type of mindset that you have to have. When you go and pull your credit report to look to see if you have any errors, you need to be getting that pen and paper. What is this? Who, this, my name isn't right. I don't know whose phone number this is. I want this deleted now, right now, immediately, and send me a copy showing that you did it. Like that's the type of mindset that you have to have as a consumer because if you don't, they'll do anything. So many, I see so many errors on people's credit reports. So many, you, per the Fair Credit Reporting Act, your credit report is supposed to be 100% accurate. Not 99, not 90, 100%. Why would it be 100%? Because it determines how much you got to pay in interest for your car. I mean, it determines if you're going to be able to get approved for that apartment. So if it's wrong, that can make or break if you get approved or not. So it's imperative that they are in compliance and nobody is challenging them. That's the thing. When a debt collector calls your house, people don't even answer the phone. Who is this? They're not even allowed. You don't have to give any of your information. They are not allowed to just tell, to say that they're a debt collection company. They, or not that they're a debt collection company. They're not allowed to say who the debt is for or what it's about until they verify that they're speaking to that person. So you can be on the phone, debt collector call you, who is this? What's your name? What, what company is this? And uh, is this Raquel? Is your date of birth? I don't give information out over the phone. Don't call this phone if, if, if you're looking for that person send it in writing. And you never have to disclose because there's so many scammers out here. You don't have to be afraid to answer your phone. You can tell them to cease and desist all calls and if they call you again after you told them that, you can get a consumer attorney to sue them. It's a thousand dollars just for that for them calling you again after you told them not to call you. So we have to stop being afraid to answer our phones, to open our mail. You get a collection letter in the mail, there's always a disclosure that they have to put on there from part of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that says you have 30 days from the time to receive this, no this notice to dispute the validity of this debt. If you do not, we are going to assume that it's valid. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if it's valid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how many people don't even open that collection letter? I do just do it as well. But then that's it there. Then it's it. Mm -hmm. When you, but should, I did. you should now always with, validate that. With one of them, I did call because it wasn't true. It wasn't a debt. I said they're paid. So why are y'all calling me for something I already paid? And the lady's like, well, I don't have this in my, this is, I don't, I don't have it in my system. I said, cause it's not even your system. It's in somebody else's system who I paid. And so you don't even count. So I'm paying you some money. I already paid them a whole different company. And that's why you shouldn't be calling people in writing. Okay. Well, in writing. Okay. Because it's a lot of you can never do stuff over the phone like that. Okay. So you clearly in writing. You can do it in writing. Okay. happen of course the past year, but it was because my mother's name and my neighbor are close to it. Yeah. She's been dead 35 years. Yeah. And because. <laughs> This debt is dead, so, and you're not going to get it from her anyway, and uh, I don't even know why you're still in your system. Because this is the thing when it comes to debt, they can collect forever. Because oh. at the end of the day, so they can collect. This is this secret. This yeah. is the secret, though. Debt is always old no matter what. Because mm -hmm. you took out the loan, you bought the items, you know, yeah, it's old debt. no matter what. But... After the statute of limitations in your state, depending on where you live, six years in Ohio for credit debt, after six 
cashiers is now considered time barred debt. So that means they can no longer try to sue you for that debt. So they can no longer come after you legally for the debt, but they can attempt to collect. They can, they, if they send you a notice in the mail, it must say in big letters, this is a time barred debt. You can pay if you want, basically. There's no incentive for you to pay that debt because it's past the statute of limitation. They can never come after you and sue you. You can just be a good consumer and pay it if you like, but you do not have to pay the debt. So where do you come from? Because she's been dead for 35 years. Because some collection agencies, they're always reselling what they call zombie debt. <laughs> Breaking it back for the day. Oh, that's 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 believe it or not. No, it's no, called no, zombie no. debt. <laughs> and it is basically because it's if they no. can collect wow. it's true. $50, they'll do it. Yeah, my dad got a credit card with, it's Navy Federal now. It wasn't even Navy Federal then. It was before I was born. I'm 30, about to be 31. He called, because I'm like, well, get a Navy Federal account, you know. And I was telling him, like, what I was doing to get my credit together. So he's like, oh, okay. He called them, and they told him he had a debt that's 32 years old. He said, he said, I had a credit card with y'all. He said, they said, in 1987, y'all, you had a credit card. That's exactly what the, the he said, and it's still in y'all system? That's exactly what he said. <laughs> so he's like, I didn't know I had it there. It was when he was on a ship in the Navy is when he got that credit card and forgot all about it. It was 32 years old, and they, they told him that. He said, I can't believe it, that they still have a debt from 32 years old. It's way before I was born. I said, that's older than me. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know if I should pay it because he wants Navy Federal to find, to refinance his house. So I told him, well, you have to pay it if you want them to do that. Absolutely. And even, so it's different with certain lenders. Some lenders, once it's past that and they've written off the debt, they delete it out their system. Okay. Whereas like a bank like Navy Federal, oh, no, they once you go that. bad with them, you, yeah. it's a wrap. They don't, they're, un, they're an unforgiving bank, period. You either going to clear up your relationship with them or you will never be <coughs> American Express is another one. That's USA. They do not like people that file bankruptcy. If you have a bankruptcy, American Express is not letting you in, period. Especially if you file bankruptcy on them. Even after the bankruptcy is off your credit, they keep it, they blacklist you, is what it's called. They, they basically blacklist you. Question? So back when you were talking about the college loans and you were talking about your friend who had the 200000 like, what amount of a loan did she apply for? Because right now I just got mine rehabilitated and they're all like in a good place right now. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, okay, how can I get these all together so I can start attacking it as like one So number? you can consolidate your student loans under where they're still government backed. Right. Um, and of course you qualify for so many other deferments and repairs. Mm -hmm. But once you go private, this person went private, you no longer get all of those in there. Okay, so you don't get that once you get. So you can still do it when you you can consolidate your loan federally. You consolidate them into one loan. You can do that federally, okay. but it would just more. You don't have like a set five year term. Put it like that. Where gotcha. You have that set loan payment. Where you said she had five years. So I'm saying, do you know like how much she her loan was for? It was high. It was probably like fifteen hundred dollars, and she paid more than that over the balance, she was paying like $2,500 a month. She had a high paying job. Right, obviously. And she lived below her means for about 18 to almost 24 months and she attacked that That's debt. That's a really good idea. Tremendously, oh she took out a five year loan with SoFi to where she had a set high payment. Of course, she qualified due to her debt to income. She had a high paying job mm -hmm. and she just really truly attacked it. Even though it was five years, she had to pay it off in two years. But she attacked. That's good. And if you are going to be a person that pays the minimum balance, you, you're never going to pay, off your school. pay it off because you aren't going to pay it fast enough to go up against the interest that's occurring. It's, it's not. You're in a different race. Gotcha. So these are some, and you actually have them on your handout. Some items that you can apply for if you do not have any credit. So those are some links that you can type in. That's a, a secure card through a credit builder card that I'm partnered with that actually does a soft pull. A 
on your credit. So there will be no hard inquiry to qualify for this secure card. You will have to fund it with your own money if you don't qualify, like I said, for like the Capital One Unsecured or the Discover Unsecured, and you do need a secure card. This is a great secure card that I recommend even to my own clients. And um, it reports six times a month which is really good depending on what your balance is. You know, they have like six statement dates, you know, to help someone that's starting out, rebuild their, either rebuild or start with credit. And um, it does have an annual fee, but once you start to build your file up and you start getting approved for unsecured cards, you will then close that card as long as you have good usage and everything, you'll get your money back. And um, it's very good for credit building purposes. And then I also recommend another link that you can go to, which is my jewelers, and it is a jewelry card. It is not meant for you to buy any jewelry. The jewelry isn't worth a quarter, but it is for building purposes. Um, but if you purchase at least a hundred dollars worth of jewelry that you will probably never wear, <laughs> um, you they will give you extend you a five thousand dollar limit on the card which a five thousand dollar trade line account will show them on your credit report on all three credit bureaus and once you make the two payments that's it you let it sit on your profile it's going to help you build history you know and those two payments are going to show you have some type of good usage and so that's a really good card and then new clothes work the same way it's more so household items little radio gear but it's not worth much so it's probably going to be something that you utilize these are for building purposes only and then the last link is through self lender and again you strictly are taking out a loan against with borrowing money for yourself so you're paying yourself back at the end of the 12 months or 24 months whichever one you decide they will mail you a check back for your own money and then we'll report to all three bureaus that you were able to show behavior that you can pay the same amount over time and that's how you can get that good credit mix. Go ahead, Marcy. The, um, uh, I don't know how to put it how you can make money, but it's, my husband paid his teeth fixing mm -hmm. and they all didn't care of credit. Right? You pay the um, you pay, make the payment every month, you don't you don't pay any interest on the mm -hmm. start. It's just uh, it took him a couple of years mm -hmm. and he really to so pay this. So you pay it all the time. Yeah. Now the interest, somebody's paying the interest somewhere or something. So the way this works is all credit cards work like that. If you pay your balance in full every month, you don't pay any interest. But the, so, but they're not banking on you to, they want you to forget. <laughs> if they want you to not pay it off in the 12 months because at the end of the 12 months, guess what's going to happen? All the interest that you were expecting to pay is now going to be balloon onto your care credit account. So if you took out a $2,000, used $2,000 on your car for those braces, and the interest is supposed to be six, dollars $700, and they say, hey, if you pay this off in 12 months, you don't have to pay any interest. But to come 12 months and you still owe $75, you only owe $75. $700 is going to be added to that card that you now have to pay. So for the people that have good credit, they don't pay interest because they're responsible and they pay and avoid interest. But the people who don't have good credit, which is majority of society, they know that you aren't gonna pay your balance in full, so they're gonna get interest. And they know that you aren't, because you're like, oh, I only gotta pay $50 a month. The monthly payment is never set up for you to pay it all in 12 months. I'm just saying, but the monthly payment that they gave you was not set up to pay it off for 12 months. You had to pay something more than that to actually amount to what needs to be paid in 12 months. That's how they get you, because they give you this low payment. And you're like, oh, I only got to pay $30 for this $2,000 TV. So then you pay $30 a month for 24 months, and then come to 24 months, you still owe $700. And you're like, now you now owe $1,500 because they've added all the interest. So you have to do your due diligence and read everything because it's really not set up for you to not pay interest. They want you to not read in between the 
lines, not do your due diligence, not know what's going on, so that you can pay interest. So you have to trust me. They, they're making money. That's why they're in business. So what's your advice for college students? Because of my lack of knowledge, when we started raising our children, I always told them, never get credit, never get credit. Now I'm like, okay, now my oldest son does have a car, which was funny by accident, because he went to cold before he started school. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I think I have a cold car now. Oh so, but he paid it the same day. So I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, you have a cold car. So we just keep it at home and it, it stays low utilage. And, but my youngest one now, I'm like, do I do this, do this, for, this route for him? Because they're both in college, but. So I would definitely recommend if you have a car yourself, Like, 
I don't want to say this, but I, a lot of, like she said, back in the day, they did, credit was not good. You, we didn't have conversations like this when, we, when I was younger and stuff. But I'm glad I'm learning now because my kids, I got a 73 year old, they, I, they're going to know. They're right. going to know Absolutely. this type of thing. And anybody I can help, my little sister, she's 26. I help her, my little brother. I got everybody on the ball because my mother didn't teach me because her grandparents' credit is bad. So she didn't know. It's not that she didn't teach me, she didn't know. How she's going to tell me something I, she don't know. Right. But now I'm glad I'm learning this stuff. It's hard, but it's easy, if that makes sense. <laughs> and, and you you said something that I wasn't aware of that this system was just established in the eighties. Yeah, exactly. So who was you know we couldn't pass a, pass along that generational knowledge because yeah. it just kind of was implemented. Because the way they were I had no idea. Credit was unfair. The way yeah. they did credit and lending was unfair prior to this. Jersey just passed a law recently where ch uh, high school students have to ha learn financial literacy. It's some schools that do, but it's like the private schools and all yes. that type of stuff. They have it. We have one mm -hmm. school in Cleveland Public in rural elementary on the west side, and they um, they used to think that they worked with the Johnson Society anymore. So the Cleveland Public Library they worked directly with the Johnson Society. We don't teach personal finance at all. Wow. 
eight to report your information to the three credit bureaus. And some companies only pay to report your information to one bureau. Like say, for instance, a lot of credit unions, I'm not familiar with who simply federal reports to, but most credit unions, you know, they're typically small, you know, smaller credit unions, they maybe only can afford to report to two bureaus. So you have an auto loan with them and they only report to Experian and Equifax and you're wondering, well, why my credit Trade union union. score isn't that high? And it's because they aren't reporting that usage and you aren't getting any type of credit mix and installment history on your TransUnion report. And this is why Equifax and Experian are higher than this one. Um, so each creditor or lender, they actually have to pay to report your information. And you know, some, just like how certain lenders only pull one bureau because they have to pay to pull your credit report. They are paying to look at your information. That's why it's so hard to dispute and to correct these items because they want to keep their customers happy and keep you with bad credit and, you know, keep them making more money compared to having you all cleaned up and everything is good because if that's the case, why don't they all just report? You know, but they have to pay to pull your credit report and they have to pay to report your information. And each lender, normally, typically your bigger banks, the ones that really have the money, they report to all three. Whereas when you get to your smaller companies, your binder, payer, all the lot, they may only can afford to report your car payment to one bureau. So that this is why your credit scores are different because each lender may not all be on the same, all three bureaus. And then even when it comes to inquiries, American Express only pulls Experian. AD Federal only pulls TransUnion for credit cards. But if you apply for a loan with them, they're only going to pull your Equifax. You see what I'm saying? So you're only going to have your inquiry on this bureau. So you can literally apply for a credit card with American Express, you're only going to see an inquiry on Experian, and then go get a credit card with AD Federal, you're only going to see an inquiry on TransUnion. But both of those banks pay to report your information to all three credit bureaus. Whereas like Buckeye Credit Union, they only report to two. So it just depends. Whereas Capital One, when they pull your credit, they pull all three credit bureaus. They want to see what you're doing on all three. How are you looking? So it just really depends, and that's why you have to do your due diligence and know what's going on, who's pulling what, making sure your information is accurate. That's why it's very important that you get a copy of your credit reports every year and you review them for accuracy. And I don't want to ask about this. I don't know if it's true. I was told that certain viewers are more popular depending on the region you live in. Yes. Because oh, I, I always hear a lot of people use TransUnion here, but like Experian, like it's more like West Coast or something mm -hmm. like that. And Experian, believe it or not, is one of the easiest bureaus for lenders to report information to. They're the easiest to get access to from a lending point. Whereas TransUnion, you need at least 5,000 customers to be able to report 5,000 accounts to even get access. Or, you know, like oh, they all have certain criterias that the companies have to meet to even be able to get an account with them to even report your information. Whereas Experian, you can just get right in, start reporting. You know, it's easier. So more information may be on your Experian report, and that's why. Right. Because, oh, yeah. <laughs> everybody can. Right. Right. It's a big scam. It's a big business. It really, truly is a big business. They say it's big, but this is a scam. Yes, it really is. So you have to do your due diligence. And so just going over, just to recap, to complete a credit file, you need at least three to five credit cards and at least two forms of installment accounts to start building the perfect credit score. That will give you a good credit mix. If you pay all of those accounts over time, you will get some nice history. If you can get an authorized user account, that will speed up that history category. And if you, so you'll get the payment history, you keep your utilization low on your credit cards, of course you'll get the utilization points 165. The only way to speed up your points for history, again, will be the 
authorized user with those different accounts that give you a good credit mix. And as long as you're not applying for credit and you are letting it build, I mean literally, within no time, three, six months, you will have 700 plus credit scores. Okay, so with the installments, I have one with my credit union right now, not any federal, I, it's my job credit union. I want to pay it off so it's not good because that's the only installment I have on my credit. It's reporting and it's in good standing because it comes out my, I send money to my account every month and it's just, it's just there. It's like $25 a week or whatever I'm paying, but I want to pay it off. So I'm just going to tell you this, what, are you in the market of applying for something? Because that is going to And that's the thing, that's the only installment one I have on my credit mm -hmm. and it's, it's in good standing. Do you have any student loans? I have student loans, but they're in deferment because I'm back in school. Yes, but that's still reporting as to the UC. Okay. So yeah, then, then that's fine that you pay it off because you have another form of an installment account helping you. Okay. It has history, so you're fine with paying that off. Okay. See, that's the thing. They want to see a variety. So you got student loans, you got a personal loan, you got, you know what I'm right. saying, a car loan. That's three forms of an installment account. So okay. you can pay it. You can afford to pay off one. Right. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. I'm going to pick your brand. I'm sorry. Cover no, car no. loans. Right now, I'm getting stuff because I pay a lot because I had terrible credit when I got my car sold. Mm -hmm. I'm paying too much with interest right now. Yeah. I'm getting stuff from Capital One free approval for, you know, to put a lower interest rate. Now, the thing is, if I do a refinance, someone told me it's better for me to just get a new car instead of refinancing the car I already have. And the reason why that is, depending on how old your car is. It's only about to be two years old. Okay. Well, when it's newer, but it still depends, you may not. It may not be a good thing. People recommend refinancing, but you have to think about what exactly are they giving you? Because if you owe $10,000 right. and your payment is $250 a month, and then you took out a seven year loan, right? Yeah. Six year loan, Six years. okay? Yeah. And then you decide two years later to refinance, they're gonna re-extend your loan to lower your payment. Exactly. You have to calculate how much are you gonna pay okay. for that term and match it up with how much you're gonna pay if you continue to keep your payment the same. Okay. You're better off if you really wanna, you know, save money, is all you have to do is pay more over the balance and put it towards the principal. That to eats away interest. See, I put like an extra ten dollars to go to the principal. Even an extra ten dollars will eat away the interest and okay. go faster than what it would be if you refinance. Okay. A, loan origination fee or whatever, they end up giving you some type of fee, doc, okay. document fee, you know, whatever, compared to what you would do. It just depends on your situation. Okay. If you are a person that got 20 something percent, yeah, yeah, it will be in your best interest. And it, it's, it's, it's up there, like 20 something percent. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So it is in my best interest to refinance. Yes. Okay, all right, that's all I need to know. <laughs> I was gonna say, cause I have to refinance from all along for people and they'll be paying like 18, 20% and with the credit union you could get like a fixed six percent even if your credit isn't that great and right. they can lower your payment you could pay it off but you just have to keep in mind this is why I say do your due diligence even though your payment is being lowered remember even though they lowered your interest rate they're also re-extending your loan mm -hmm. and okay. spreading it out so it may even match up to what your interest rate was and okay. that's why you have to do your due diligence and calculate okay they said my payment is 250 72 payments, let me times that, this is how much I'll pay, I only have 36 payments left on this, and then my payment is 150, let me multiply that. Okay. And then match them up. And if it's, it's almost anything. the same, it's not worth it. You're okay. better off adding extra to the principal and attacking it on your own. Okay. And speeding up the process. You can pay your loan off quick by adding more money to the principal. Late payment, late fee money, 
you have the money to buy the groceries, put it on your car and pay, and it, pay it off. That's what I do. That's all you have to do. I mean, and they are going to reward you. You're going to earn cash mm -hmm. back. You're going to get points. I mean, you can end up and get a hotel stay for free, an airline ticket for free. So or all of it for free. Or all of it for free. Mm -hmm. You know, I can only imagine the perks that you've received because, uh, you know, everything paid off. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> you probably haven't spent a dime. Raquel, are you involved at all in the next, in the presentation on April 25th? No, I don't know. We can talk. Do you know anything? Do you know anything? Were any of the um, four presenters, or is this a new? Group? This is a new group, and if you um, check back in about a week, we'll have more information about the presenters. Okay. So, so free to invite you back. Exactly. Yes. Yes. We'll, we'll so I'm gonna say, you know, end on this note that you always want to monitor your credit daily, weekly, monthly, because someone can just like how credit card your account you know you just never know you want to always open your mail um, if you do notice some type of inaccuracy do not go online and dispute you always want to do it in writing okay. because doing things online and over the internet they can change that information they can I mean they really can do whatever they want they, mm -hmm. you, you don't give them the um, requirements that they have to follow through paper mail mm -hmm. if, by doing it online and you up a lot of your rights when you do do any type of dispute online where you can't sue them and because now you're um, activating your disclosures you know oh, they okay. make you an arbitration agreement that you handle any dispute arbitration and you don't want that because if you if your rights are being violated you want to be able to truly go after them for that information and so it's very I strongly recommend if you do have any type of inaccuracies, you always want to dispute online, you get a collection company, you always want to validate the debt. Never ever just pay a collection company because they send you something in the mail. Mm -hmm. Never ever do that. You always want them to prove, validate that this debt is yours first. You know, always. You never ever just want to pay a debt. So I am a credit repair company, so if you do have any issues with your credit, we do assist with helping you clean up some of those blemishes and give you credit building tools and education to help build your credit profile. And you can reach us, 800-507-4599, or on our website, royalfinancial-services.com. And that will conclude our presentation. I learned some more stuff. Yes. <laughs> I feel like we could do another two hours on this. Um, but no, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, before you leave, if you did, please make sure that you sign in. Please make sure that you complete the survey and you want to leave that on your seat. Um, check out our next seminar. You should have information in your um, your worksheet that, that lets you uh, do uh, direct you to the link if you scan it, um, and you can check out the next financial um, literacy seminar. And also, if you follow, if you're on social, follow us on social. We have some amazing events coming up. Um, if you have any ideas, I know we got into talking about how great this content was. If you have any ideas, should we be doing more? Is there something else that we can, we could be doing to share this information with the community? Please let us know. Um, and again, thank you.